Shuli Barzilai is a professor emerita of English at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her book, Lacan and the Matter of Origins, examines Jacques Lacan's thinking about the mother's role in psychical formation. In her second book, The Tales of Bluebeard and His Wives from Late Antiquity to Postmodern Times, she traces how the Bluebeard story is retold by writers as varied as Charles Dickens, William Thackeray, Anne Thackeray Ritchie, Angela Carter, and Margaret Atwood. Her essays have appeared in Critique, Diacritics, Parcel Answers, BMLA, and Word and Image, among other journals, and in many edited collections. Shuli is honored to count herself among Ruth Niveau's graduate students at the Hebrew University. In fact, a paper she wrote for Ruth's inspiring, one of her inspiring courses, was later revised and published as Shakespeare's Coriolanus and the Compulsion to Repeat. In a collection, strands of far removed Israeli perspectives on Shakespeare edited by no other than Avi Oz. Beyond the university precinct, Shuli admired her former teacher's turn to the visual arts and is proud to say that several of Ruth Nevo's paintings grace the walls of her home, also mine. Shuli, please. Oh, when mine eyes did Olivia first see Methought she purged the air of pestilence. That instance was I turned into a heart, and my desires like fell and cruel hounds ever since pursue me. Had you studied these lines from Act One, Scene One of Twelfth Night with Ruth Neveau, you would have soon learned that Orsino, the idle, bored bachelor duke of Illyria, has found himself an occupation and a pose he has assumed the theatrical role of an unrequited courtly lover, a role that was familiar cliche for Shakespeare's audience. True to character type, Orsino elaborates a figurative transformation of himself into a heart, H-A-R-T, pursued by fierce hunting dogs, that is, by his unreciprocated desires. Pursued by microphones. Orsino's allusion to the mortal Actian's encounter with the goddess Diana was yet another familiar trope, whose primary source for Shakespeare was the work of the Roman Ovid, or in full, Publius Ovidius Nasu. Ovid's metamorphosis, a long continuous weave of ancient myths in 15 books, was widely read in Latin and in translation during the re <coughs> excuse me, during the Renaissance, in Britain, for instance, Arthur Golding's translation, first printed in 1567, was reprinted five times by 1603. Shakespeare was, you might say, well versed in Golding's translation, and often echoed it in his own works. Thus, the context-specific motifs of male spectorship spectatorship, when mine eyes did see Olivia first, of erotic desires as self-ravaging and consuming, my desires ever since pursue me, and of self-injury or hurt by the heart, H-E-A-R-T, in Twelfth Night constitute part of a broader ongoing cultural discourse and context. Shown in linear temporal sequence, the textual intersections presented in my core talk will include Ovid's Metamorphosis, Titian's Diana and Actian, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, Simon Armitage's Diana and Actian, Tony Harrison's Diana and Actian, and Patience Agave's About Face, after Titian. This chronological sequence, however, is a misrepresentation. Its linearity partly obscures the overlapping conversations and dialogic relations 
among these and other texts. Like Shakespeare the poet, Tiziano Vicelio, the painter known as Titian, brought classical myths to life during the Renaissance. Like Shakespeare, Titian may have consulted contemporary sources, such as his friend Ludovico, Ludovico Dolci's Italian translation of the Metamorphosis, published in 1553. Titian's masterpiece, Diana and Actian, illustrates a story retold by Ovid about 1,500 years earlier. How did Titian come to paint this particular subject? After Titian had completed two portraits of King Philip II of Spain, which evidently found favor with the powerful monarch and art patron, the king commissioned a series of paintings from the artist based on the metamorphosis. Titian worked on the royal commission for 13 years, from 1549 till 1562, coining the word poesie for his works because he considered them the visual counterparts and equals of Ovid's poem. As demonstrated in Diana and Actian, Titian was a close reader of Metamorphoses. Turning now to book three, lines 138 to 52 of Ovid's account. It so happens that one day while Diana, goddess of the hunt, the moon, and chastity, protectress of women and especially virgins, is bathing with her nymphs in a crystal clear pool of water surrounded by dense pines and cypresses that Actian, quote, strays with aimless steps and enters the sacred grove. His intrusion is entirely inadvertent. As Ovid underscores, if you look carefully, you will find that it was the fault of chance and not wickedness. What wickedness is there in error? Unquote. Nevertheless, Actian is summarily turned into a stag, a heart, and torn apart by his own dogs. The god's punitive anger is not pacified, quote, until his life had ended in innumerable wounds. And yet, although the fault of chance and not wickedness, and yet, although not the fault of chance and wickedness, Actian's fate could be read as an exemplary instance of what Prince Hamlet calls the engineer hoist with his own petar. As explained at the episode's start, it happened on a mountain stained with the blood of many creatures. And then a few lines later, Actian announces an end to the hunt only because of the midday heat and surfeit of success. Quote, friends, our spears and nets are drenched with the blood of our victims, and the day has been fortunate enough. Fortunate, of course, for some, is gravely unfortunate for others. Actian's innumerable animal victims will have their day in court, however, for the appeasement of Diana entails a form of poetic justice. Now, if you were commissioned by a king to paint this episode, which moment would you choose? Titian's choice is the complex moment in which three components in the Aristotelian trajectory of tragedy may be said to converge. Actian's harmatia, his fatal error or blunder, the misstep leading to his literal downfall, appears to coincide with his anagnorisis, the moment he grasps the catastrophe that has befallen him. Moreover, the error and its recognition occur together with a periptia, the turning point after which there is no reversal or reprieve as the plot moves toward its denouement. Titian's masterfully compressed poesie. In Titian's masterfully compressed poesie, Actian's arms that have just set aside the blood-colored drapery veiling the grove are simultaneously upraised to ward off the sight as well as the fate unveiled before him. 
At Actian's feet lies a bow apparently dropped when surprised by the scene. On his back, we see a case with arrows, and at his heel, a dog trained to hunt with him, partly obscured at the margins. Directly opposite, Diana's diadem with horned crescent moon, emblem of her Olympia status, Olympian status, visually reiterates not only the curves of her limbs and the striped cloth over her attendant's back, but also, more ominously, Actian's fallen bow. Shortly after, the metamorphic punishment takes place. In Ovid's description, quote, on his knees, like a suppliant begging, he, Actian, turns his word, wordless head from side to side as if he were stretching arms out, unquote. As if he still had human arms that corresponded to his still human consciousness. Titian sent this painting to Philip of Spain in 1559 together with another canvas illustrating the mythic transformation of Diana's nymph Callisto into a bear. Acting as a pair, art historian Jill Burke suggests, the paintings have hung, would have hung next to each other as seen from the glistening stream that flows from one to another. Nearly 500 years later, <clears throat> in 2012, both paintings were exhibited together in public for the first time at the National Gallery, London. The exhibition of these newly acquired masterworks were among the, were among the highlights marking the London 2012 Olympic Games. It may be noted parenthetically that in the unequal face-off between Diana the Olympian goddess and mere mortal beings such as Diana, such as Actian and Callisto, there was no sport or fame, fair game involved at all. But leaving such incidental ironies aside, the National Gallery published a slim but rich volume titled Metamorphosis, poems inspired by Tish to accompany the exhibition and for the gift of this volume, I am deeply indebted to the generosity of my former student and present colleague, Karine Berkman. Thank you, Karine. In the book's preface, the director of the National Gallery, Nicholas Pen Penny, explains that, the 14, that 14 poets were selected by a quote unquote expert panel and invited to respond to the paintings. In other words, the poets were commissioned to re-envision Titian's pictorial metamorphoses of Ovid's poetic narratives, thereby transforming visual poesy back into an originary verbal meaning, medium. Among the poets' various responses, I will include three dissimilar poems that nonetheless share certain thematic continuities particularly an emphasis on ways of seeing, even while presenting highly individuated speakers. Less obviously than may first see, seem, Simon Armitage describes the painting through the eyes of Actian himself. The whole hillside being smeared and daubed with the blood of the hunt, I dropped down to a stream whose water ran clear and cool and followed its thread through a wooded fold among branches dressed with pelts and skulls. Then stumbled headlong into that sacred grove. That's when the universe pitched and groaned and I shrank from cloud colored flesh, from calf and hip, curve and cleft from a writhing feast of fruit and meat, salmon, silver side, red currant peach, fingers worming for gowns and robes, from eel and oyster, ankle and lip, from bulb, bub, bud, honeycomb, nest, and flinch. From Diana's arm bent back like a bow and flinched from Diana's naked glare a death stare arrowed from eye to eye, 
all seen in a blink, but burnt on the mind. The pink red curtain of noon drawn back unleashes the white wolves of the moon. The opening sestet does not speak for what is actually in the painting, but rather what may be extracted from its textual source. Thus, in using the verb stumbled in line six, Armitage reiterates Ovid's insistence. Ovid, Armitage reiterates Ovid's insistence on the fault of chance, on the innocence of the soon-to-be victim. The second stanza, an octet, however, may be read as an inversion of the initial exoneration. It implicates Actian in the male gaze that habitually objectifies and dehumanizes the female subject. He perceives them piecemeal, disjointed, piled up on a platform that also serves as a platter full of edible objects. Following Ovid's epic style, Armitage provides a long list of items. Actian's reaction to the scene is acutely ambivalent both repulsion and attraction, both disgust and desire. He sees a writhing feast of fruit and meat. He sees fingers worming for gowns and robes. In this reading, when Actian flinches in stanza three, from Diana's arm bent back like a bow, and from her naked glare arrowed from eye to eye, he has just recognized the flaw that will determine his destiny. The law of lex talionis, of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, has but just been set in irreversible motion. It is not because of his literal misstep and trespass, but rather because of his perception of Diana and the nymphs in his mind's eye. Bulb, bud, honeycomb, nest. The goddess therefore dooms him to be dismembered and devoured in a manner commensurate with his reductive, dissecting, wolfing gaze. The punishment is made to fit the crime. Hence, too, the cause-effect resonance of the concluding couplet, the pink-red curtain of noon drawn back unleashes the white wolves of the moon. Excuse me. Like Simon Armitage, Patience Agbabi, Agbabi presents a mythic counter from within the painting. However, rather than a central character, a major player, Agbabi's poetic eye speaks from the place of the black attendant shown helping the goddess to cover her nudity. Agag, Agb Agbabi speak, gives this literally marginal figure a strong voice and presence, endowing her with a soliloquy of protest and critique of Titian's titular subjects. Neither Diana nor Actian are found blameless in her monologue. About face after Titian. Actian, you will pay the price for looking like a god, athletic, proud, immortal. Diana, goddess of the hunt, will hound you. She is too harsh. You should have looked at me. I am her shadow, black yet fairer than the mistress, clad in cloth finer than Cirrus. I want you, Actian. I wish I were shroud white. Oh, that you notice me and mouth each monumental curve. Her handsome face off guard, you brushed aside the drape to see how cool she bathed. With a pool spray, she cursed you for looking. In this pine sweet grove, you turned from man to horned and dappled stag, sentenced. Look how your fate reflects itself in water. Look how your fate reflects itself in water from man to horned and dappled stag, sentenced for looking. In this pine sweet grove you turned, how cool she bathed. With a pool spray she cursed you. Off guard, 
You brushed aside the drape to see each mountain monumental curve, her handsome face shroud white. Oh, that you'd noticed me and mouth. I want you. Act in. I wish I were the mistress, clad in cloth finer than Cirrus. I am her shadow, black yet fairer than she is. Too harsh. You should have looked at me. Diana, goddess of the hunt, will hound you like a god. Athletic, proud, immortal. Actian, you'll pay the price of looking. To my regret, I couldn't show you this on the same page. Both the stanzas, well, I'll talk about that. Agbabi's title is made to tell and foretell all. The poem is after Titian, not merely in the sense of inspired by in the manner of chronologically later than his works. The words also point to a positionality well past or beyond the imperial colonial world displayed in his painting. Most telling, I suggest, is the title about face, an expression made to perform multiple functions in the poem. When used as a noun that denotes a 180 degree turn, a reversal of direction, attitude, or viewpoint, the words about face are usually hyphenated. The absence of hyphenation in this instance points to several meanings at once. The poem's title could refer to the definitive turn or reversal in Actian's fortunes when he enters the sacred grove but it may be also understood as literally about or concerning the face. Actian, the speaker says, you should have looked at me rather than the goddess. And again, oh, that you noticed me, but you failed to see, as you might have done, had my face been shroud white like hers. Her handsome face, off guard, you brushed aside the drape to see. Moreover, as Agbabi's opening lines stress through a striking use of enjambment, let's go back a minute, Actian, you'll pay the price for, oops. Actian, you'll pay the price of looking like, for looking like a god, athletic, proud, immortal. That is, it is not only for the divine face he sees, but for resembling a god himself and challenging the immortals. Agbabi distills the myth's meaning in relation, in relational reference, reference to face, black versus white, human versus godly. In reformatting the scene, as it were, in order to bring forward the racism implicit in it, Agbabi also shows the effects of normalized colonial domination on the psyche or soul of the colonized. The speaker seems to have internalized her epidermal inferiority. The self-reference in line five, I am her shadow, designates not so much her actual position behind Diana as her positionality, which is delimited by her skin. Black, yet fairer than the mistress. In echoing the Song of Solomon, Agbabi's poetic persona invokes the influential mistranslation of the King James Version of the Bible, first published in 1611. I am back, black but calmly, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. In Hebrew, the, connector, the conjunction connecting between black and fair is not but, I am fair despite the fact that I am black, but rather the conjunction and appears, a small switch or slip that institutionalizes a big, dif big difference. Everything hinges on the translation of the letter Vav. Most translations, roughly 80%, change the original and, vav, into but or yet, thereby transforming the actual meaning into an epidermalization of the colonial order. It was not until 1989 that the mistranslation of verse five was finally changed in the new revised standard version of Song of Solomon. I am black and beautiful, 
O daughters of Jerusalem. At this point, you may want to ask, why did Titian introduce this figure into his portrayal of an otherwise white-skinned entourage? After all, Ovid mentions no black companion in his list of Diana's band of nymphs, and Titian usually follows his illustrious precursor closely. In this 16th century setting, I propose, she functions as a status symbol, a possession indicative of wealth and high social class, comparable to the pearl strands decorating Diana's hair and the fashionable lapdog barking at her feet. I wanted to go back to the painting, but never mind. Here I'm going to go. Viewed thus, Titian's anachronistic interpolation of a black woman may be glossed by another painting, albeit Dutch, of an unknown family, burghers, prosperous enough to be dressed in velvet and lace and to commission a portrait from Franz Hals. Four of the five people represented stand in the same plane. The black boy, dressed in brown, stands slightly further back. Likewise, a sad-faced poodle stands at the margins of the group. And I'll just point that out in case you don't see it. You see the poodle? <laughs> Returning once more to Babi's title, which we have never actually left, the title about face also does something else. It designates the formal design of the whole poem. Composed of two stanzas, each a sonnet in itself, the poem performs an about face at its structural center. The 14 lines of the first stanza are repeated in reverse in the second. Specifically, at the midpoint in line 14, with look how your fate reflects itself in water, the poem begins to pursue, proceed backwards, as if in rewind or replay mode. Comparable to the asymmetrical symmetry of mirror images, the stanzas repeat and reflect each other, and yet significant variations do occur. Even the identical wording of the first and final lines, for example, implement a variation. Whereas one line carries over to the next, Actian, you'll pay the price of looking like a god, and con continues on from there, the full stop in line 28 signifies the poem's ending as well as the finis, the terminal point of Actian's story. Actian, you'll pay the price for looking, full stop. In its structurally mirror-like dimension, however, Agbabi's poem not only reflects upon itself, it also pays the homage of imitation to Titian's painting. The crystalline pool at the canvas bottom serves as a mirror that, repl that replicates the scene taking place above it. Like Agbabi's second stanza, it is not the same as what it repeats. To conclude this discussion on a humorous and ominous note, let us turn to Tony Harrison's revision of Titian's painting. The challenge posed by Harrison's poem lies in answering the narratological questions, who speaks, who sees? And you, sir, yes, sir, you, who just began to read these lines, you're maybe a marked man? Haven't you half thought that while you view Actian's intrusion, you're intruding too? Perhaps too chubby for most modern tastes, for less am pulchritude and skinny waists, Diana scorned by, scorn by connoisseurs of scorn, that's a hard, <laughs> Diana scorned by connoisseurs of scorn punishes those who'd pimp her as plump porn. Actian stares at the stag skull, the flayed skin above the nymph who dries, who dries Diana's shin. The stag stalk skull in its prominent position over mortal flesh immortalized by Titian maybe, mark, maybe marks you out to share Actian's doom after you've left the safety of this room. On those Diana's flesh makes salivate and clock the stag skull's sockets far too late. Stiff sprouting hairs will suddenly appear and flesh hooked faces 
fur up like doomed deer. As you exit through the gla gallery's glass doors, that antler's head reflect that antlered head reflected, is it yours? For survival's sake, when leaving best beware of baying bloodhounds in Trafalgar Square. Huh? The poem's dual tonality, its, con its combination of glowering menace and winking humor, arguably stems from its incongruous formal techniques. On the one hand, the poem is written mainly in iambic pentameters, five weeks strong stresses per line. This is the classical rhythm of blank verse of Shakespeare's plays, which is by definition and time-honored practice unrhymed. On the other hand, Harrison uses the rhyme couplets known to us from far simpler poems and doggerel from verse often not intended to be taken seriously. And yet note that no end rhymes are repeated. Are repeated. Moreover, the inventive rhyming of odd couples, such as scrawn, pawn, salivate, too late, best beware, Trafalgar Square, may elicit our smiles and admiration. So formalities are observed and subverted simultaneously. But shifting now from the tone of the poem to the speaker's identity and location, it remains difficult to pinpoint. By contrast, the addressee is emphatically clear from the onset, which is also an onslaught. You, sir. Yes, sir, you. The guilty party is the male reader and viewer, the visitor and voyeur at the National Gallery who oversteps the line and stares like acting at the flesh immortalized by Titian. In contrast to Armitage and Agbabi, Harrison has situated the one who speaks and sees outside and not inside the painting. So once again, if not a figure or object represented in the painting, then who speaks? Who sees? Here is one potential amply qualified candidate for the speaker spectator's position the surveillance camera with built-in audio capabilities. Sometimes also called Big Brother, it never sleeps. Nevertheless, even though it constitutes a defining feature of the electronic panopticon we are constrained to inhabit, the poem's speaker may elicit some sympathy, f excuse me, some sympathy for an idea identification with its anti-Actian attitude. Haven't you half thought that while you view Actian's intrusion, you're intruding too? Harrison thus reflects on Titian's socio-historical frame of vision and extends it into our present contentious moment. Having said that, however, you are all cordially invited to pro propose your own candidate for this still open position. Thank you. <laughs> 